All right. What's going on with all these people attracted to socialism? Um, you know, a, a lot of it, as we've talked about in the past, a lot of this could be attributed to, to just ignorance. Uh, I mean, a lot of people are, are truly ignorant of uh, history, certainly of the history of, uh, of capitalism, uh, of the history of, um, uh, let me just do this. One second. History of capitalism, the history of, of just the human race. And, and they don't have any kind of sense of what life was like before capitalism. They don't have any sense of what actually capitalism has done because they're not taught it. They don't know it. Uh, so some of the, of the support, I think, socialism and socialist ideas get uh, comes strongly from a perspective of uh, ignorance of, of history. I also think there's a significant ignorance with regard to what capitalism is. People associate the current state of the world with capitalism. They consider what's going on today with capitalism, with all the problems and the warts and the, and the difficulties that actually are real, that do happen. All of those problems associated with capitalism, including kind of the cronyism and, and, and people in poverty and, and the, the lack of maybe social mobility or economic mobility, although there's some argument about how much of a lack there really is. They just don't know. They, they think this is it. This is the alternative. This or some ideal of socialism. So it's, it's a lot of ignorance out there. There's a lot of just not knowing, not knowing. Oh, Jeff is late for the uh, Alejandrina birthday party. But thank you, Jeff. That is, uh, that is a very generous uh, gift to the Iran Book Show and to, uh, in, uh, to Alejandrina, in Alejandrina's honor. So uh, I appreciate that. You know, uh, I think a, a, a hugely powerful motivation for why people tend to be socialist and we'll talk more about this. This is going to be a, a major theme because I want to talk about the, the psych psychological implications of this, is that they want to be good. That is, they associate socialism, welfareism, they associate the welfare state with morality, with being a good person. They associate it with, with, with justice. They associate with um, being a, a, a good human being. Now, I try to think back on why I was a socialist, because I was a socialist before I read Atlas Shrugged. Now, I was young, so I was, you know, uh, I, was, I read Atlas Shrugged when I was 16. So it's... Um, you know, it's hard to extrapolate from yourself, and it's hard to extrapolate from yourself when you're young. But what motivated me to be a socialist? I, I, I'd say a, a few things. One is a complete lack of understanding of what capitalism was. I, I really didn't know. I didn't know what business was. I didn't know where wealth, create, where wealth came from. The world was just as it is. I was born into this world. It's as it is. And do I like what I see or don't I like what I see? And, and so I'd say that's point number one, just ignorance. I knew history. I, I knew dates and battles and generals and politicians and Greek and Rome. But I didn't know, and this is interesting because I don't know that anybody focuses on this in their curriculum for history. I didn't know what life was like. And there's a sense in which I still don't know what life is like 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago. I mean, that you don't study how did people live? What was life like? No electricity. <laughs> uh, people dying all around you. So I had no clue about capitalism, no clue about business, no clue where wealth came from. And 
I was an altruist. I, I mean, I truly believed that the, the, the purpose was to help other people. That's what morality meant, to be a good person, was to help others, particularly help people within your tribe. But I had a sense that that was kind of wrong. Um, I remember telling my parents once when I was like 12 that if I fell in love with a, with a Muslim or an Arab, I would marry them. They, they were shocked and upset. Um, and my parents were pretty leftist liberal, but yet here I was saying, well, you know, you treat people as individuals. And I, but I, that didn't go, that only went so deep because I was also really collectivist at the same time. Um, in, in some respects, maybe that was a first indication, maybe what, I wasn't as collectivist. Uh, so, you know, the quality of life, the, the evolution of life, what life was like, I, I, people don't know, I didn't know, but I, uh, this, this, whole, um, this whole idea of, of, of the purpose of morality and what it meant to be a good person and what, what it meant to be heroic, right? There was a big part of growing up in Israel was focused on, on heroes and being a hero, what it meant to be heroic. And, and for us, or for me, what it meant to be a rogue was sacrificing yourself to some cause. And that cause was typically the cause of the nation, the cause of the state, the cause of the people. And, and capitalism was clearly not about that. Capitalism was about people just, as I saw it at the time, being superficial, being materialistic, not caring, and just living their lives for no particular purpose, right? This is, this is uh, Jordan Peterson's meaning of life, right? You have to, you have to find meaning outside of yourself. Why well, had meaning outside of myself? It was the sacrifice to whatever, fill in the blank. So I remember that in class, as kids, we used to argue about whose parents were poorer with the idea that poverty brought with it virtue. That is, we weren't arguing which of our parents was more successful and richer and so on. No, that would have been a black mark. We were arguing which of our parents were poorer and therefore which one of us was more virtuous having grown up in a poorer, poorer household. Poverty was somehow virtuous. And I have no, no idea where that came from. No idea where that came from other than seeped in from a culture of altruism, from a culture that says, never be selfish, never think of self, always be selfless, think of others, others are what's important. Therefore, wealth is a sign of self-interest, wealth is a sign of selfishness, wealth must be therefore condemned. So I definitely had that kind of psychology, the psychology of Michael, wow, thank you. That's like third, fourth super chat question, and uh, you know the sum of money just keeps increasing. Uh, that Michael's doing today. I will get to all these questions, I promise. Um, in uh, in a little bit. Let, let me let me just get a little bit of this off some of my thoughts off, and then we'll get to some of this. There's some good questions here. Um, so. The altruism plays a huge role. So uh, I, you know, felt guilty for, for, for the fact that maybe we had a little bit more money than others, and we never had a lot of money, but we had a little bit more money and other kids. And it was this guilt thing that drove, no, 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 my parents are poorer than your parents because you didn't want to be own up, own that guilt, right? You didn't want to own that guilt. So uh, there, was, there was a lot of that. There was the, the collectivism, the altruism, the, the, the guilt, the, um, the association with uh, virtue to poverty and vice to capitalism. And I have to say that my views of capitalism were tainted by the fact that when I was between the ages of 14 and 16, uh, I spent the ages of 14 and 16 in the United States. Uh, and uh, going to school, middle school and then high school, eighth and ninth grade in the United States. 
And I hated it. I hated it because Americans struck me, uh, particularly American kids, but American is in general as superficial, as materialistic, as uh, uh, unambitious. I mean, the kids in my school were super, in, in, in school at least, not ambitious. Um, it's just uninteresting. Uninteresting. So it was, um, so I was, I was already, you know, that was to be capitalism. America represented capitalism. And it represented capitalism from a cultural perspective. And it, was, it represented capitalism from an economic perspective. I saw that they were rich, but I also saw that they were spiritually poor. Right. So add all this up, and, and at least for me, and I, thought, I think otherwise I was, <laughs> other than that, I was pretty healthy. I was, had a, a fairly strong sense of um, uh, competence and confidence in the future and general benevolence towards people. But the altruism and the ignorance undercut all of that. And I lived with this idea that you have to help people. And part of that is, part of that is, I think, a sin of intelligence and ability and, and, and being, you know, relatively speaking, at least middle class. Although relative to Americans, we were poor. Within Israel, we were middle class. And that means that you have a sense. I had a sense. I think a lot of these socialists I debate have a sense that they can take care of themselves. They'll be okay. But they have a strong sense that other people cannot. They have a strong sense of superiority. And, and I definitely think I had that um, when I was 16. And then, of course, I read Atlas Shrugged. I read Atlas Shrugged, and it blew me out of the water. It, it, it completely educated me about what business is, what Dagny and Riordan and these people actually do. And it clicked that the things around me, the things around me are not just there. They don't just show up. They're not just a fact of reality. That they are created, that somebody must create them. It's uh, today um, I had a debate with a very intelligent professor of politics. And it's like, all you want to talk about was, all right, we've got all this wealth, we've got all this stuff, how do we allocate it? What's a just allocation of the stuff we have? What if some people have more and some people have less of the stuff we have? And it was like, where does the stuff come from? It doesn't just show up. It's not just here. Somebody has to create it. And that's essentially where property rights come from. It's the fact that that creation happens and that creation is necessary for life. It's necessary for flourishing, for, for human survival, for human success, for individual human success. As I said to Vosh, you either produce or you die, even if you don't literally die. You psychologically die. So, they just, and, and Atlas Shrug really, I mean, Atlas Shrug really shows you that. It's one of the few books that actually describes what happens in business. Not as a, in a fantasy way. It, this is stuff that really happens, the kind of negotiations, the on the one hand, the cronies, on the other hand, the productive ones, what the productive ones have to do. It's not sugar-coated. It's hard. It's hard work. They, you know, and these business executives work super hard. And if you read about real-life examples, you know this. Dagny's not unique in that sense. 
So it truly is, it truly is amazing how much she gets into Adler Shrug. So uh, Adler Shrug taught me about what was, um, what business actually did and where values actually came from and where this, uh, all the stuff that I had around me, where it was from. And then, I mean, the real revelation to me of Alice Shrugged was, and you mean I can live for myself? And there's a moral code? And it's right to live for yourself? I mean, that was a, a true revelation. Truly stunning. I'd been taught since I was this big that my purpose in life was to live for others. So it cured me of the altruism, at least explicitly. But once you're cured of the altruism, but it's not enough. It, it, there's also the knowledge and the understanding of what capitalism is and what production is and what, what, where wealth comes from, where products come from, where reality, it all comes from. So Alice Shrug cures you of that, if you're honest about it. But for a lot of people, even Atlas Shrug doesn't do it. And a lot of people won't even engage with Atlas Shrugged. So what kind of psychology does altruism inculcate in people? And I think there are two versions of it. And, and, and I think the psychology then makes them super anti-capitalist. And if you combine that with their ignorance and their blind spots and their unwillingness to look because it'll challenge the deep psych psychological held beliefs, it's almost hopeless to convince them. So I'd say there are two ways in which altruism affects people. Right? One is, let me just, one is the way it affects the person of, I'd say, mixed ability or, or mediocre ability, mediocre ability, or weak ability. The person who might be struggling a little bit in class, might be struggling with math or with any topic and, and, and is just not sure of himself. And altruism basically teaches that person that it's okay to fail. It's okay to be poor. It's okay not to succeed. Because the role of others, the role of those who are successful, is to help you. It's to assist you. It's to provide for you. And what it does, what altruism gives that person, instead of instilling that person, which what you would like is with ambition and with excitement and with motivation to try harder, with the conviction that they can succeed if they try harder. What altruism gives them the conviction is it's okay to fail. Because others are required. For others, it is a duty to help. And indeed, your moral status as being helped is not inferior, it's not a downgrade. The meek shall inherit the earth. Indeed, you're the virtuous one. Your poverty, your lack of success, your inability actually makes you in some moral sense superior to those who have to sacrifice for you. Right. So, it instills a, a psychology of uh, victimhood because if they're not helping me enough, it's their fault, it's not my fault. It tells them that they're entitled. It, it, it instills in them a psychology of entitlement. 
And maybe most importantly, it denies them. It denies them the confidence. It denies them the ambition of trying, of achieving, of succeeding, of pushing themselves to the limit, of being the best that they can be. Because being the best is a burden. Altruism also instills them with a real, with real fear. Real fear. Because their lives now they come to learn are completely dependent on others. They depend on others for others, charity, livelihood, welfare, jobs that others create for them. They become dependent. And they embrace that dependency because that's what morality, in a sense, demands. And that's what morality, it, it makes sense. But that dependency has to cause them to feel fear. To fear reality, to fear change, to fear what happens to them in the world. What happens if these other people decide to be selfish bastards and not help and not do their moral duty? How am I going to survive? How am I going to survive? If my whole life depends on others. Remember, altruism teaches you that your life depends on others. You're either a sacrificer or to be sacrificed to. That is the moral responsibility. <laughs> so... It's, um, it instills a psychology of, of fear of taking care of yourself, fear of being left alone, fear of what? Of the marketplace, of, of capitalism, uh, you know, fear of, of oh my God, in, in capitalism, if something happens, I lose my job or something bad happens, I'm going to be dependent on the charity of strangers. But they owe me. Their moral duty is to help me. Why should I be dependent on their charity when morality dictates that they need, have to, help me to be good people? They must sacrifice for me. So, uh, of course, the welfare state. Let's make sure they do the sacrifice. Let's make sure they help me. So, oops. so altruism inculcates a psychology of fear, of resentment, of envy, of those who are successful, of victimhood, of entitlement. It is destructive to self-esteem. I mean, the whole idea of self-esteem is pretty selfish. Why should you esteem yourself? Altruism rejects the idea that you should esteem yourself. Properly, fully. So it takes the people who are, you know, not the most intelligent, not the the greatest achiever. And it turns them into entitled victims. Whining about the horrors of capitalism, the horrors of those who have succeeded and create wealth, who are not helping them enough because they deserve it. I am to begin with 
I wonder if I can ask you to capsulize. I know this is difficult. Can I ask you to capsulize your philosophy? What uh, is Randism? Uh, first of all, I do not call it Randism, and I don't like that name. All I right. call it Objectivism. All right. Meaning a philosophy based on objective reality. Now, let me explain it as briefly as I can. First, my philosophy is based on the concept that reality exists as an objective absolute. That man's mind, reason, is his means of perceiving it. And that man needs a rational morality. I am primarily the creator of a new code of morality which has so far been believed impossible, namely a morality not based on faith. On or faith. Not on faith, not on arbitrary whim, not on emotion, not on arbitrary edict, mystical or social, but on reason, a morality which can be proved by means of logic, which can be demonstrated to be true and necessary. All right, all right. Now, may I define what my morality is? All right. Because this is merely an introduction. My morality is based on man's life as a standard of value. And since man's mind is his basic means of survival, I hold that if man wants to live on earth and to live as a human being, he has to hold reason as an absolute, by which I mean that he has to hold reason as his only guide to action and that he must live by the independent judgment of his own mind, that his highest moral purpose is the achievement of his own happiness, and that he must not force other people nor accept their right to force him, that each man must live as an end in himself and follow his own rational self-interest. All right, before we go on, reminder, Please like the show. We've got 163 live listeners right now. Uh, 30 likes. That should be at least 100. I figure at least 100 of you actually like the show. Maybe there are like 60 of the Matthews out there who hate it. But, but at least the people who are liking it, you know, I want to see, see a thumbs up. There you go. Start liking it. I want to see that go to 100. All it takes is a click of a, a, click of a, a thing, whether you're looking at this uh, and, and, you know, the likes matter. It, it's not an issue of my ego. It's an issue of the algorithm. The more you like something, the more the algorithm likes it. So, you know, and if you don't like the show, give it a thumbs down. Let's see your actual views being reflected in the likes. But uh, if you like it, don't just sit there, help get the show promoted. Of course, you should also share and uh, you can support the show at yourownbookshow.com slash support or on Patreon or Subscribestar or Locals uh, and, uh, and show your support for, all, for, for, for the work, for the value hopefully you're receiving from this. And, uh, and of course, don't forget, if you're not a subscriber, even if, you, even if you just come here to troll or even if you're here like Matthew to defend Marx, uh, then uh, you should subscribe because that way you'll know when to show up. You'll know what shows are on, when they're on. You'll get notified, right? So, um, yes, like, share, subscribe, support. Like, share, subscribe, support. There you go. Easy. Do one or all of those, please. <laughs>